Hello, everybody. Thank you for um, having me here. And I want to apologize for wasting your time. I'm sure you're all, you're all up here and you want to hear loads of tips about how I became a successful entrepreneur. I hear my story. And then once you hear it, you're going to just agree with me. I'm just jammy. I'm always in the right place at the right time. Okay, I'm not terribly good at being an entrepreneur, but I always seem to be there. T to start my own, to, go back, to tell you how my story started, I'm going to go back to my university days. When I was young, my parents wanted me to be a lawyer, okay? It was instilled in me, you are going to be a lawyer, end of story. So I wasn't a terrible good student, and I graduated, and my parents managed to, to get me a job in a legal firm. And I went to work for the first day, and it was absolutely horrendous. Like, it was totally horrendous. I was there for two hours, and do you know what? I thought, do I really want somebody to boss me about and tell me what to do? So after about two hours, I thought, I'm not coming back after lunch. So at lunchtime, I just walked out, okay? And I thought, I'll go back to university, I'll do, a P I'll do a postgraduate of some description, and that'll be fine, I'll just lease about for another couple of years. So that, that was my plan. So I, I walked up to Strathclyde University, went to the careers office, and I said, I'd like to do a postgraduate, please. And they said, sorry, they've, they've just started, and it's not like an undergraduate degree. Uh, come back next year. So I thought, okay, fair enough. So I'm on the train, and I'm going home, and what's going through my head is how on earth am I going to explain to my parents, okay, that I've just walked out of this job? So I'm sitting on the train, and directly opposite me is a guy, and he's got a huge pile of computer magazines, must have been about 30 magazines, and I'm a really nosy person. Okay, I'm very, very nosy. I just, you know, I want to know everything that's going on. And I like speaking to random people, so I, I just walked up to him, and I, I started chatting to him, and I said, why have you got so many magazines? And um, he says, oh, it's my job. And I thought, what, you read magazines for a living? And he goes, uh, no, I'm a purchaser. I'm an IT purchaser. I buy IT equipment. And I was like, all right, okay. And um, he says, that's why I've got all these computer magazines. And I was like, okay, fair enough. And I thought, surely that's an easy job. I, you know, that was going through my head. So I just asked him, I, thought, I said, surely that's a really, really easy job. All you do is basically, you've got two computers, you just buy the cheapest one. And he says, no, Shaf, it's not about that. It's actually about support. It's about finding a partner. It's about somebody that provides you services. And I sat there and I thought, okay, that sounds quite good. And I knew, you know, by the time I got off the train, I had picked this guy's brain. I knew how the IT industry worked inside out. I knew the mind of a purchaser. So I got off the train and I went home. And the first thing I did was I sat down with my parents and I, I blagged it with my dad. I said, dad, I'm going to go back to uni. I'm going to become a lecturer, X, Y, and Z. So he was delighted. He said, what are you going to do for the rest of the year? And I said, oh, I'll do some charity work or something. So he was absolutely delighted with that. And um, I thought, right, I need to start up an IT company. So that's what I did. So everything that this guy had told me, basically, I put it all in a nice little brochure and I started posting it out to people. And I started picking up the phone to random companies and basically tried to sell them IT equipment. And one of the random companies I phoned up was um, the Ministry of Defence. It was the, the Royal Air Force. <laughs> okay. And um, basically, I tendered for a contract. And about four weeks later, I got a purchase order for half a million pounds. Okay. <laughs> See, I told you I was lucky. So I've got a purchase, purchase order for half a million pounds. Now, you, we need to put this into perspective, okay? I'm like a 21-year-old guy, okay? I've got 6,000 pounds in my various half a dozen credit cards, and I have a purchase order for half a million pounds. And I thought, oh my God, how am I going to do this? So I thought, that's dead easy. I'll just go to the bank. Banks lend money. You know, banks lend money. Do you all agree with me? Banks lend money. So I turned up to the bank, and I went to the Bank of Scotland. And I had a meeting with the business manager, and I'm like, Hi, my name's Shaf Rasul. I've just set up an IT company and I have a purchase order here from Her Majesty's Government for half a million pounds. I'd like to borrow half a million pounds, please. And <laughs> literally, they threw me out, okay? They literally threw me out. So I then went to the Royal Bank of Scotland. Now, they're, they're a bit more civilised, okay? Um, they're a bit more civilised. I, I managed to get a cup of tea out of it, I got a couple of biscuits, and. <laughs> What they explained to me was, Shaf, you need three years' accounts before we actually lend you any money. I was like, okay, fair enough. 
So in those days, I didn't quite grasp the concept of money, okay? So my father, okay, who owned a news agency, okay, probably earned, I don't know, two, three hundred pounds a week. So we sat down for tea and I thought, you know what I'll do? I'll tap my dad up for it. I asked my dad for a loan, okay? So I'm sitting there, we're having our tea and I'm trying to sort of pluck up my, pluck up courage. Just, just imagine we're all sort of sitting around the table, we're having our tea and I'm sort of building myself up and eventually I said, dad, I need to borrow some money, okay? So my dad just ignored me, carried on reading the newspaper, okay? So I said it a bit louder, Dad, I need to borrow some money. And he says, how much? And I says, well, I need about 500,000 pounds. <laughs> and he went absolutely ballistic. I've never, you've never seen anything like this, okay? So now I'm homeless as well. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> So I thought, how am I going to deal with this? What, what on earth am I going to do? So in the end, okay, through a combination of basically some suppliers giving me some credit, etc., being sort of semi-honest with the REF, I managed to deliver it in stages, okay? So I managed to do the delivery, and lo and behold, I've got, you know, I've made a huge profit. So then what I started doing is basically I started buying underperforming companies, okay, and I, I bought a number of them, I sort of turned them around, I don't know, I don't know how I manage it, how I know it's a good deal, okay, some people are good at playing golf, some people are good at whatever, I'm very good at identifying a business and saying, do you know what, I, I would do it that way, and I would do that, and I would do that, and that's what I did for a number of years, and I set up a chain of computer shops, and I set up a, a very successful exhibition company, and by the time I was about 26, 27, I thought, do you know what, I'm just lucky. Okay, I'm in the right place at the right time and I'm going to do a really bad deal and I'm going to lose everything. So what I decided to do, okay, was I decided to take the coward's way out. I thought, I'll just sell everything, okay? So I'll sell everything, I'll go back to uni, I'll get, I'll do a postgraduate and something and I'll get a proper job and I'll bank the money. So that was the plan. So that's what I did. So literally everything I owned, basically, I sold it. So I had several million pounds in the bank, okay? And, um... I was going to go back to Strathclyde University, and I had one small business, okay? Um, and basically, this business was a, a computer business, and um, it was really just a retail store. So I had this one small business, and what I'd been doing from time to time, I knew there'd be people that are in similar circumstances to mine where they've got a contract, okay, but they're not able to fulfill it because they don't have the funding. So sometimes people would come up to me and they'd say, Shaf, I've got, you know, I can supply 5,000 TVs to Dixon Store Group, say, okay, I can buy them for £100, I can sell them for £150, unfortunately, our cash flow won't permit it. And I would come to some sort of a deal where I would fund, where I would, you know, when I would fund a thing. So from time to time, I was at sort of almost investing in businesses. And one day, I got a phone call from a chap called Kieran. And um, Kieran phoned me up and he says, hi, Shaf, I understand from time to time you basically fund deals and you buy excess inventory. And I said, yeah, that's right. And um, he says, basically, I have a cancelled order. I have six or eight containers of blank CDRs. And I said, kid, what are they? And he says, oh, it's blank CDs, you know, you, you record music onto them. And he explained the concept of a CDR to me. And I said, what are they? And he says, well, they're basically, I can't remember the figure, but let's say they're 18p, okay? So he says, they're 18p each. And I says, do you really expect me to buy something off you that's the same price as a packet of crisps? Okay. And he says, Shaf, can I come and see you tomorrow? And I said, no. Okay. I says, no, don't bother. And, you know, I've got my mindset. I'm going to go back to university. That's my business career. It's, it's all over. That's it done. So the following morning, um, basically, I'm on my way to the gym, okay? And um, basically, I'm on my way to the gym, and my PA phoned me up, and she says, Shaft, do you know you've got a 9.30 with a guy called Kieran? I was like, what? I says, I told, I, I have not arranged anything. She goes, well, he's just phoned me, he's landed at Edinburgh Airport, and he says he's got a 9.30 with you. And I says, well, for God's sake, don't tell him I'm at the gym, just say I'm not here. I says, I don't even want to speak to the guy. She goes, yeah, okay. So I went to the gym, I won the running machine, and just as I'm about to get off the running machine, a big English guy gets to the running machine next to me, and he's like, hi, Shaf, I'm Kieran, pleased to meet you. <laughs> so, um, so basically, I'm going, Kieran, I don't, I don't want to speak to you, okay? I don't want, I, you know, I'm, I'm going back to you, I don't want to get involved in a business, etc., etc., etc. So, um, I got off the running machine, went to the showers, and he's in the cubicle next to me, shouting, go, let me buy you lunch, okay? 
So I says, yeah, okay, fair enough. So he bought me lunch, and um, basically we started talking, and I felt really bad for him. I said, Kim, how many of these things have you got? And he says, I've got, I can't remember the figure, let's say it was six trucks, I've got six trucks. And I says, okay, I says, Kim, I don't have a warehouse, okay? I don't have any sales staff, basically. Why on earth would I want to do this? And he goes, come on, help me out, just buy, just buy some of me. So I says, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll buy a truck off you. So he says, yeah, okay. So I bought a truck's worth of him. Now, because I had an IT exhibition company, I know lots of people in the IT business. Okay, I know absolutely masses of them. So this truck of optical media turns up, and I just phoned up 24 people I knew. And I said, I'm going to send you a pallet of optical media. Could you sell it for me and just pay me for it? And they're like, yeah, no problems at all. And this was to happen midweek. It must have been a Wednesday or a Thursday or something. So the following, the following Monday, my phone started ringing, and it was about 7 o'clock in the morning and it just wouldn't stop ringing. And I'm trying to ignore it, okay? I'm just thinking, I don't want to answer this phone call because I've got my, myself in the mode of, I've got one final business to sell, tiny little business, and then that's it, I'm going back to you. So eventually I answered the phone and I thought, oh, oh my God, it's one of these people I've sold optical media to, I bet you this stuff doesn't work or something. So I answered it, and it was a good friend of mine, and he says, Shaft, those um, optical discs you sold me, have you got any more? I says, let me find out. So I phoned all my other customers, and they'd all sold them really well. So I thought, oh, that was a bit of a result. So I just sat and worked out the profit. And I thought, if I could buy them for X percentage cheaper, and if I could do this, if I could do that, this would actually be a great little business. So what I did was, I phoned Kieran and I said, Kieran, go and ask your boss to give me a call. So basically, Kieran's boss called me, and I agreed to buy all his stock. Okay, then I went to see a friend of mine, his name's Bruce Glantley, and Bruce sorted out my, he works at Ernest & Young, and he sorted out all my tax affairs, and I said, Bruce, you remember you said to me once that I should just surround myself with the right people? And he said, yeah. I says, I want to set up another business, okay, can you find the right people for me? And he says, absolutely. So basically, he got me, got me a sales director, he basically got me an FD, and we started a business called Enet, okay, which distributes optical media. And the first year, we turned over 37 million pounds. Okay, we made one and a half million pounds profit. In the second year, we turned over 50 million pounds. We made two and a half million pounds net profit. That's after tax. Third year, we turned over 67 million pounds. And we set up a phenomenal business. On the back of that business, we set up another business called Data Safe Media, which basically licenses intellectual property. At its peak, that was basically making net profits of a million pounds. We set up numerous property investment vehicles. Actually, I need to tell you a story about how I became involved in the property business. Just when I had decided, okay, that I was going to go back to university, I had loads of money in the bank, and I didn't know what to do with it, so I thought, I'll just ask one of my friends. So I asked a friend of mine, his name's Grant Williams, and he says, Sophia. And I says, Grant, I've got some money, and I don't know how to invest it. And he goes, Shaft, buy property. I says, are you sure? He says, look, think this through. There's only ever going to be one George Street in Edinburgh, okay? You can't build another one. He says, and if you own property in George Street, it could only go up in value. So I says, yeah, that's a good idea. So I said, what should I buy, commercial property or residential property? He says, buy either or. It really doesn't matter. Just have a good mix in your portfolio. So I says, yeah, okay. So what I decided to do was I was going to go out and buy some flats, okay? So I went out, went out, went out one weekend. I went to see lots of flats, and I went to, you know, I was chatting to people, and I was saying, excuse me, how much do you want to sell your flat? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Could you make me an offer? And I said, well, just tell me a price, and if I like it, I'll buy it off you. And nobody would give me an answer. So by about five o'clock, I was really, really peed off. And I was driving by, just, just further down, sort of towards Leith, and I was driving by a little site. And there was a big sign, and it said Barrett. And I thought, they sell houses. I'll just go and see basically how much they charge for a flat. So I nipped in, and I spoke to the salesperson, and I said, excuse me, how much do you charge for a flat? And he says, well, and they had a big scale model. And he says, well, that one there, and he pointed to the scale model, that one there is called the Mayfair's, okay? That's the, the Mayfair range, and we charge 75,000 pounds. And that one there, we charge, you know, 62,000, and that one there, we charge 83. These are all hypothetical figures. I can't remember the exact figures. So I says, okay, so I just give you 83,000 pounds, and you build me a flat. He says, no, you just give us 1,000 pounds. I was like, okay, so I give you 1,000 pounds, and then when you build it, 
pay for the rest of it. He says, no, you need to pay us 10% further down the line and then the balance when we, we finish it. So I, I thought, do you know what? I'll just quickly build myself up a property portfolio. So I says, okay, give me 10 of them, give me five of them, give me seven of them, give me six of them. So I ended up reserving about 40 flats, okay? And as soon as I walked out of the door, about three days later, I heard talk about a Scottish Parliament. And all these flats that are not even built yet, okay, have gone up in value. And I've got loads of them. <laughs> So this is the start of the credit crunch coming now, okay? So I thought, hang on, I can make some money here. So I phoned up all my friends, and I says, listen, I've got this flat, okay, and it's worth £100,000. Okay, I'll sell you for £80,000. Bear in mind, I've probably paid £60,000 for it. I says, I'll sell you for £80,000. It means that you don't have to pay a deposit, and the rental income will pay your bank loan. I'm going, brilliant, Shaf, yeah. Okay, I'll have that off you. So before you knew it, I sold most of these flats, and I didn't even own them, okay? And I'd made a huge profit, and the ones I'd kept were free. So that was, a, that was a total result, as far as I was concerned. So being the nosy sort of person I am, okay, being the nosy person I am, I thought, you know what, I'm going to try and understand what Barrett do. I'm going to do the same thing as them. So basically, I had lunch with one of the directors of Barrett, and I says, explain to me what you do. And he says, well, Shaf, our business model is we buy land with planning permission, we build houses, we sell them. It's dead easy. And I says, why don't you just buy land and get planning permission yourself? And he says, oh, no, that's too risky for us. We wouldn't do that. So I says, so let me get this right. If I bought a field, I says, how much would you pay? He says, the rule of thumb is we'll pay you £50,000 a plot. Okay, so I says, define a plot. He says, well, if we can build one house in it, it's basically one plot. If we can build 10 flats on it, it's 10 plots. So I says, okay, let me get this right. If I bought a field and I got planning permission, basically, to build two houses, you pay me £100,000 for it. He says, yeah. So I thought, okay, that can't be that hard, that hard. So that's what I started doing. I started buying some stunning, stunning sites in Edinburgh. The best one I ever did, actually, was I bought a site for two and a half million pounds at nine o'clock in the morning, okay? And I met a pal of mine for lunch, and I must have met him at half 11, okay? And I sold it to him for, actually, no, did I pay three and a half for it? Yeah, I must have paid three and a half because I sold it to him for 5.5 million pounds. So I made two million pounds in the morning. That, that was one of the best results I've ever had. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'm trying, I'm trying to think of what else you might want to know about. How did I get on the Dragon's Den? That's, I always get asked that question. Basically, in the height of the, the sort of property stuff, I was asked to do the Dragon's Den, and I, I really didn't want to do it, okay, because I just thought, I don't fancy being stuck in London for ages and ages and ages, so I thought, nah, I'm not going to do it. So I said no. And about so four years on, uh, my sales director, Susanna, had a phone call, and it was the BBC, and they said, we, know, we were in touch with Shaf a few years ago about doing the Dragon's Den. There's a new version of the Dragon's Den, and basically it's called the Online Dragon's Den. And would Shaf, you know, would Shaf consider basically doing a, a screen test for it? And Susanna phoned me up, and she said, do you want to do, do, you want to do a screen test for the Online Dragon's Den? And I says, no. No way. She says, okay. And she says, what shall I tell them? I said, just tell them I'm sick or something, right? I, I, you know, I don't want to do it. She goes, yeah, okay. So about four or five days later, I turned up to the office and there's a BBC camera crew standing in the foyer. Okay, so I thought, do you know what I need to do? I need to just make a mess of the screen. Make, just make a total mess of the screen test and basically not have me anyway. So I did the screen test and um, they did a fake pitch to me and I thought I was taking the mickey out of the poor wee girl, but obviously I wasn't. And the next thing you know is, I'm an online dragon. So, so that's, how be, that's how I got involved with Dragon's Den.